from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I'm going to shorten my message a little bit tonight because there's a little chill up here. I don't know whether you have it, but we have it up here. And I know the stadium has been filled a long time and you've been sitting here a very long time and I'm sure that some of you are tired and some of you have a long way to go home. So I'm not going to take too much of your time. It doesn't take long to present the gospel. I heard about a man that was supposed to speak for, 30, for 20 minutes and he spoke for 30 minutes. And after an hour he was still speaking and the man that introduced him could stand it no longer so he picked up the gavel and threw it at the speaker. And it missed the speaker and hit a woman on the front row. She said, hit me again, I can still hear him. Thank you. Now I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verse 38, we begin. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. In this passage that refers back to the little book of Jonah, just four chapters in that book, it's one of the most controversial books in the Bible, but it's also one of the most thrilling and interesting books in the Bible. And you read it from one end to the other and it's filled with excitement, but it's also filled with the gospel. He was looking forward to the gospel, to when Christ would come and would die on the cross and spend three days and three nights in the grave and be raised from the dead. We were in Florida just after Andrew came in. We went down to South Dade. We conducted a service. It was called a service of hope for the people there. Jesse Jackson was there. He came and sat on the platform and led a prayer. The governor of the state had invited us. And we saw a devastation such as we've never seen anywhere. I don't think Hiroshima or Nagasaki in Japan suffered anything worse than what you see today in South Florida. But it seems that so many storms and hurricanes are coming up this year and others are being formed in other places. Then we read about Guam, and then the storm that hit France and Great Britain just three or four days ago that did such devastation in southern France. And here, these Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders are listening to Jesus, and they ask him for a sign. They said, Lord, give us a sign. What kind of a sign will you give us to show that you're really the Son of God? You do these miracles, but give us a real sign. And Jesus said, you are an evil and adulterous generation, and you are seeking for a sign. You want some big show to prove that I am the Son of God. But the only sign you're going to get, you'll get in reading the book of Jonah. Years ago, a front page story in a newspaper said that a two-ton shark had been lassoed by an Australian. That probably was Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> and also in Australia, a man was stalked by a killer crocodile who caught the man and coughed him up in eight pieces. 
We made a motion picture in Australia once called The Shadow of the Boomerang. And there was a beautiful young woman that was the star of that picture. And after we left, she went swimming with her boyfriend out on one of the beaches. And she was in about three or four feet of water just waiting. And a shark came and took off her leg. And before they could get any help to her, she had died. Now this has been called a fish story, but it's more than that. It's a true story. It's the story that Jesus himself refers to. He attested to it. There are 300 different kinds of sharks alone, but the Bible does not say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. It says that Jonah was saved not destroyed by a big fish. And I believe it because the Bible has it and Jesus authenticated it. With all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting the facts of this story than they did 50 years ago. God had come to Jonah. He lived in the northern part of Israel. And the scripture says in the first verse of Jonah, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. But Jonah did not like the call that he got. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great wicked city. That's the capital of the most powerful empire in the world. And I want you to go and preach to them and preach repentance and tell them if they don't repent, I'm going to destroy them. And Jonah didn't like that. He didn't like the Ninevites because the Ninevites would come with their armies and they were very cruel people. History tells us that they were among the most brutal people of all history. And the way they treated their prisoners was something you hardly would repeat from the platform. It was so horrible and so terrible. And Jonah didn't like them. In fact, he hated them. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to go, Lord. So he went down to Joppa, bought him a ticket and got on a ship to go to Tarshish, which is on the other end of Spain. And while he was on that ship, a storm came up, a hurricane came up. And the sailors were frightened. They thought they were going to perish and they said there's something wrong. They began to pray to their various gods. And the captain went down in the hole of the ship and saw Jonah lying there asleep. And the captain realized that something was wrong because he had heard that Jonah was running from his God. And the captain woke him up. And the sailors eventually cast lots. And they decided that along with Jonah, he admitted that he was the one that was wrong. And they said, what will we do with you? He said, throw me over the side, and when I go out over the side, the sea will calm down. The psalmist said, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? Jonah couldn't get away from God. The devil will always have a ship ready when a person wants to sail away from God. Jonah thought he had paid the fare, and the ship's captain also thought the same. They were both mistaken. The most expensive fare that anyone ever pays is when he sails away from God. Then you really pay a price. The wages of sin is death. The story is told of Aaron Burr, who was at Princeton. And he went to an evangelistic meeting and he came under conviction of sin for two weeks. And he went under the stars at night and he said, God, I can't stand this conviction that you have upon me of my sin. If you'll leave me alone, I'll never bother you again. And from that time on, we're told that his soul was dead. He tried to find something toward the end of his life, but it was too late. These sailors cast their lot and it fell upon Jonah. And Jonah changes his mind. And God had prepared a big fish. Three days and three nights he had had time to think about it. What a terrible agony he must have been in. 
There are two ways to meet judgment. Resist and go deeper in sin or turn back to God. Peter, walking on the water, began to look around, took his eyes off Jesus, and he said, Lord, save me. The Bible teaches that we are dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says that you are a body, but living inside your body is your spirit, your soul. That's the part of you that can have fellowship with God. And that's dead. And it can only be made alive by the Holy Spirit when you come and repent of your sins and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. God provides every means to escape, but you are bound hand and foot by your own sins. The Spirit must come and cut your bands, and then you will leap to liberty. Because you see, this story tells us the story of the cross. That Jesus Christ died on the cross. That he was buried. That he rose again. That he's alive tonight. He's willing to come into your heart and change the direction of your life and give you a peace and a joy that you've never known before. Jonah's gospel, and the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. God gave him another chance. God said, go on to Nineveh. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And he cried and said, he began to speak in Nineveh. He said, God is going to spare you for another 40 days. But repent, repent. Judgment is coming. This was God speaking through his messenger. Now, Jonah didn't want to do it. He didn't feel like doing it. But he was delivering the message from the Lord. And Jonah's message gave no promise of mercy. It was a message of repentance. Yet the people of Nineveh believed his message. And the Bible says that the greatest revival, the greatest evangelistic campaign in the history of the world took place in Nineveh. It was a city probably of 600,000 people, less or more, it's according to which commentary you read. And the whole city from the king on down repented. The king took off his robes and stepped down from his throne and got down in the street in the dust in sackcloth and ashes and repented of his sins. And God had mercy upon not only the king but all the people. And all the people were saved. That could happen here. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if in Portland the whole city, the whole state of Oregon, the whole of the Northwest would turn to God. The king, the king immediately proclaimed a fast and the people didn't eat, they didn't drink. They fasted and prayed. They had a great spiritual renewal in Nineveh. The men of Nineveh, Jesus said, shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But a greater than Jonah is here. If they repented at the preaching of Jonah, how much more should they repent when they hear the gospel of Christ? God is warning us right now through the spread of AIDS, through hurricanes and earthquakes and violence and all kinds of problems that are now affecting the whole world, our economic problems. All of these things God is using to speak to us. And if we don't repent, and turn to him. 
judgment will really come. In Genesis 6, speaking of Noah's day, the scripture says, My spirit shall not always strive with man, yet his days shall be 120 years. God said, I'll give you 120 years to repent. If you don't repent, you're all going to be destroyed. Then at the last, when Noah was ready to go into the ark, God said, I'll give him seven more days. And then that's it. God's grace is greater than our sins. None of us heard but one preacher. How many preachers have you heard? How many Christian television and radio programs have you listened to? How many church services have you been to? How many Bibles are in your home? Nineveh had only a single warning, a single service, and the whole city turned to God. Now Jonah was not happy about that at all. He didn't want to see the people of Nineveh saved. Jonah had a very weak moment. Not necessarily a weak man, but a weak moment does not prove that it's a weak man. Many of us have had our weak moments. And many of us have done something we shouldn't have done in a weak moment. But if you repent immediately and say, Oh Lord, I'm sorry, please help me not to do that again. He'll forgive you. And so Jonah went out to the east of the city and decided to take his camper and go rest out there and just look down on the city. Up in the, he was up in the mountains. He wanted to see what happened to the people. He wanted to see if this revival lasted. He wanted to see if this evangelistic campaign lasted. He didn't believe it would because he didn't have any confidence in the people of Nineveh at all. He didn't have confidence even in God that God could do this. But God prepared a gourd to grow over him, to protect him from the wind and the burning sun. And Jonah became so attached to that gourd that he almost fell in love with it. He loved that gourd which protected him more than he did God. And God said, if you loved your gourd upon which you have expended neither time nor labor, how is it that you do not understand my love toward Nineveh which I have planted, to which I have given years of attention, and upon which I have bestowed the labors of the everlasting love. This is the ground of God's grace toward us. He made you to be born. He put time and effort through your family, as Buck told us a few minutes ago. He poured out his love, and the scripture says, but God commends his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. the things we get out of this little book of Jonah. God has a concern for you. God is powerful and can use the forces of nature to wake you up and to bring you to the kingdom. On New Year's Day, 1929, Georgia Tech played the University of California in the Rose Bowl. In that game, a player recovered a fumble, but became confused and ran the wrong way. A teammate tackled him just before the, he scored a touchdown against his own team. At halftime, all the players went into the dressing room and sat down wondering what the coach would say. This young man sat by himself, put a towel over his head, and cried like a baby. When the team was ready to go back on the field for the second half, the coach stunned the team when he announced that the same players who started the first half would start the second. All the players left the dressing room except this young man. He wouldn't budge. The coach looked back and called him again and saw his cheeks were wet with a strong man's tears. And he said, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined and disgraced the University of California. I've ruined myself. I couldn't face that crowd in the stadium again. Then the coach put his hand on his shoulder and said, Roy, get up and go back. The game is only half over. 
When I read that story deep inside, I said, what a coach. When I read the story of Jonah and the stories of thousands like him, I say, what a God that would give me another chance. And for some of you, he's giving you another chance tonight to give your heart and your life to Christ and to make sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I open my heart and give my life to Christ. Maybe you've been baptized or confirmed and you're a good member of the church, but deep inside you're not sure. You're not certain how you stand before God and you're not certain that you have repented or that you've really by faith received him as Lord and Savior. He offers his mercy and his love and his grace to you tonight. And he says, I love you. And I'm going to ask you to come. You say, why do you ask people to come publicly? Every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Did you know that? Every person that came to Christ in the New Testament was public. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. You get up and come right now from up in the top gallery all the way around. And if you're watching by television in the other places, and the other stadium, get up and go in front of your screen as people are already beginning to come here. We're going to wait. Pray for the person to the right of you and left of you, front of you and back of you. Perhaps no one ever prayed for them before that they would find the Savior. You pray for them. Let's have this whole audience in silent prayer praying that God will do a mighty work here tonight in the hearts of many people. As many people are already on the way, you come. From up on the top row, it'll take you an extra minute to come, so start now. If you're with friends or relatives, you can bring your friend with you, or they'll wait on you. Or if you're in a bus, they'll wait. And after you've all come, I'm going to have a prayer with you and say a word to you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. You get up and come right now with these people that are already coming. You and the other places that are watching the television cannot see what we see here as hundreds of people are coming to make their commitment to Christ tonight. And you can come in your stadium, in your place, that are watching by television. You may be in the choir, and God has spoken to you these nights. And you've been having a struggle inside as to what you should do. Don't wait any longer. You may wait too long. Make it tonight. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You come. going to ask that people not leave the stadium at this holy moment because it keeps others from coming. Just get up and come. There's a little voice inside that says you ought to come. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. You come. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up number on your screen. Someone is waiting to pray and talk with you. Please don't put it off. Call right now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. 
will get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. This, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. Jesus said that. You've got to make up your mind. Now, I find the psychological and spiritual and moral vacuum in the United States and in Europe and America and many other parts of the world. Millions of young people have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. And young people are restless, I find. They want a cause. They want a song to sing. They want a flag to follow. And into that type of a situation came Hitler. He found Germany with millions of young people unemployed, millions of young people marching and demonstrating for this cause and that cause, and into that vacuum came Hitler and built that mighty military machine that almost conquered Europe and the world. Ernest Hemingway, the great writer, once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug it into. And you know, there are many young people that just never make up their mind. They never make a definite decision. Now, Christ never allowed us to be bystanders or spectators when it came to him. The word Christian actually means a partisan for Christ. It means that you have chosen Christ and you're following Christ. And partisans are never neutral. And we see today radical young people all over the world stirring up trouble, bombing hotels, bombing in airplanes, hijacking planes. They're following some sort of a cause and a lot of times we don't know what their cause is. They are restless. They want something to do. Somebody said the best thing that could happen in some parts of the world was to have a war. May God forbid. But young people want something. And these young people that we are reading about in our newspapers every day and watching on television, they never play it safe. They never sit on the fence. They are never spectators. In the struggles of our times, they commit themselves to whatever their cause may be. And I want to ask you, are you a Christian? I mean a true Christian, a real Christian. Somebody asked a, an Anglican down in London when we were down there. They were trying to witness and they said, are you a Christian, sir? He said, I've been an Anglican all my life and nobody's going to make a Christian out of me. And down in Texas, they ask a, a man on the street in Fort Worth, Texas, said, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian was used first in derision. It's a term of reproach. And many people have a wrong idea of what a Christian is, is really like. They say, well, a Christian is a person who prays. Christians pray, but that doesn't make you a Christian, a true Christian. Or they live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. That doesn't make you a Christian. You may be sincere. I watched a man in an American football game, and there were 90,000 people in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, and he carried that ball down the field. The crowd cheered, but he ran the wrong way and got a goal for the other team and lost the game. He was sincere. My mother was sincere when I was a little boy and gave me what she thought was cough syrup for my cold and gave me iodine. And she called up quickly the doctor and the doctor said, give him some cream. Well, we had a little dairy farm with about 60 cows and she almost filled me up with cream. You say, well, a Christian is a person that goes to church. Yes, a Christian ought to go to church, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You can be baptized. And you can do all of those things. And you can be called Christian, but I'm talking about a real, genuine, personal relationship with Christ. Do you have that? Or one who keeps the Ten Commandments. I've never met anybody that kept the Ten Commandments. I haven't kept them. 
You haven't kept them. Did you know that everybody in this stadium and everybody watching has broken every commandment? The Bible says that if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. So we've broken the whole of the Ten Commandments, and that is called sin in the Bible. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of God's requirements, come short of God's glory. Now, first, a Christian is a person who has made a choice. Secondly, a change has taken place in his life. And thirdly, he's accepted a challenge. And I want to make those the three things I want to emphasize. First, he's made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden made the wrong choice. They rebelled against God. They chose to build the world without God. And they made a mistake, a terrible, tragic mistake, and we're paying for it today because all the problems in the world today, including death, comes from the fact that our first parents broke God's law and passed it on to Cain and Abel, their children. They, Cain became a murderer and passed it on to you and me. And we're all capable of sin, and we all sin. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin. We're sinners by choice. We're sinners by practice. Every choice we make affects others. Moses, before he died, said to all the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life, and both you and your children will live. Choose, he said. He said to the people of that day, you have to make a choice. And a little bit later, the next man that followed him was named General Joshua. And Joshua, the 24th chapter, had all the people of Israel before him at Shechem. And he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve yourself? Choose, he said. And then he said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And Elijah was a great prophet of God. And he once had 450 prophets of Baal, who, who was a heathen god. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Christ is who he claims to be, follow him. Because I tell you this, if Christ is not who he claims to be, we're in trouble. I don't see any hope in the world at all. And the only hope is Christ. Yes, you have to make a choice. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He said only a few people are on the narrow road that leads to heaven. The vast majority are on a broad road that leads to judgment, destruction, and hell. Which road are you on? It's what you do about Christ that counts, because you see, Christ came to die on the cross, and the cross becomes the door. It becomes the gate. And if we'll enter that narrow gate of the cross and the resurrection and say, yes, Lord, I believe, I turn from my sins, I'm willing to change my way of living, and we enter the narrow road, it'll be rocky and rough and tough, but at the end is heaven. And while on that road, there's a new resource and a new power and a new joy and a new love that God gives you. Now, secondly, a, a true believer, a true Christian, is a person who has made a change in his life. And that's done by the Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live in your heart. And it says in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You become a new person. And he's the one that does it. He performs that act in your life. 
Yes, a true believer is one in whom a change has taken place. Has a change taken place in your life? You see, you act the way you believe. The Bible is clear. The change from a defeated, problem-oriented young person depends on first changing your mind. I'm going to ask you tonight to change your mind about God, about Christ. Because you see, our problems and emotional upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in the wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in life. Our problems with sex or with peer pressure. Christ can take charge of all that if you'll let him. And then a true believer is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me and deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, you deny self, your own selfish ambitions, your own selfish sinful pleasures. You deny that. And then you turn and take up a cross. What did he mean by that? He means that you are going to die with him. The cross was a place of executing criminals. He said, when you go back to your school, back to your neighborhood, back to your work, and tell them that you have received Christ, you may receive persecution. They may laugh at you. They may make fun of you. Your peers and your friends will maybe no longer have anything to do with you. You might lose some dates. You'll have to pay a price. Many of the people that followed Jesus, when he talked about death, and he said, I'm going to die, they quit following him. They didn't understand the deeper meaning of his death. They didn't realize that when he died on the cross, that was the only hope that they will ever have to get to heaven and to have their sin forgiven. Because when he shed that blood on the cross, that is the only hope that we have in this life or the life to come. Now, I know that some young people, in America at least, resist the idea of a choice of any sort. It's been called the generation of the uncommitted. They don't want to be called narrow, and they don't want to close their minds, but Jesus clearly taught that there are two roads, and you have to choose which road, there are two masters, and you have to choose which master you're going to surrender to. And there are two destinies, heaven or hell, and you have to make the choice. Because you see, God doesn't make the choice for you. God gives his son. He helps you to make the choice by sending his Holy Spirit to convict you, to speak to you. But ultimately, you make your own choice. He gave you a gift he didn't give to his other creatures. You can choose what kind of life you're going to live, and there's nothing God can do about it. You can choose what you're going to believe, and there's nothing God can do about it. Because he gave you a gift of free will. You can say, I will or I won't. I will or I won't. Which will it be for you? I will or I won't. That's the decision that you'll have to make. You see, there's death to every other choice. You cannot travel both roads. You die to one road when you go down the other. If you choose to marry one girl, you can ordinarily marry another. I said ordinarily. Life never allows that kind of neutrality. Jesus does not allow you to be neutral about him. Try to be neutral in politics, and you soon are confronted with the ballot box. But some people do not want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. And there's a time when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus demands that you decide about him. Pilate asks, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? What are you going to do? What is your decision? Before you leave here, you have to make a decision. It'll be I won't or I will. I won't or I will. Pilate washed his hands and said, I don't want anything to do with him. You have to make a decision. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter answered, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, you're right. Then some are re reluctant to make a choice for Christ because of theology about the Bible. They they're not sure about God. They're not sure that you can prove God. No, you can't prove God. 
You can't prove that God exists. You cannot go to a scientific laboratory and say, here's God in a test tube. We accept God by faith. Everything in nature tells us there must be a God. I have a watch here. It didn't just fly together. This universe that runs in perfect precision. There's a supreme being out there somewhere. We call him God. And when Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf and dumb, when they first communicated with her, they used the word God, and she said, I knew him, but I didn't know his name. There is a God, and the Bible tells us that he's a spirit, and he created the world, that he's from everlasting to everlasting. And he said, I am the Lord, I change not. But God also says that he's a God of love. He loves you. He's interested in you. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He loves you with an everlasting love, and he wants to forgive you. He wants to come into your life and into your home and into your work and into all your relationships and help you. He wants to be the pilot of your plane. He wants to be the pilot of your boat or your, the driver of your car, the car of life. And then there's some young people that will raise the question about the Bible. Can we trust the Bible? Job said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The Scripture says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired the Bible. I don't understand everything in the Bible. You can ask me questions in the Bible that I cannot answer. I accept it by faith as the Word of God, and it's changed my life, and it feeds my soul. Every time I read the Bible, any part of the Bible, I don't care where I open up, it speaks to me. It's a living book. It's not like a history book. It's not a book of science. It's a book about faith. It's a book about God. It's not just a book on philosophy. It's not a book just on religion. It's a living book that speaks to you as you read it. There's a supernatural power in reading that book. And then there's some young people that talk about conversion, and they think of conversion as some dramatic experience in which they hear bells or they see the lightning flash or they hear the thunder or maybe something like that has to happen to them. I remember the night that I came. I came in a, the crowd was much smaller than this, but I came forward and stood there, almost turned around and went back because I wondered, what in the world am I doing down here? all my school friends looking on. I knew they were going to kid me the next day, and I knew that they were going to laugh at me. But I stood there because I deeply wanted Christ. I was a member of the church. I'm sure my pastor was shocked. He thought I was one of his best young members. I was vice president of the Young People's Society of the church. But I knew I really didn't know Christ. I didn't have any personal relationship with him. So I stood there, and the lady standing next to me was crying. I didn't feel like crying. I didn't feel much at all. And I thought to myself, there's something wrong. There's nothing happening to me. But it did happen. Deep in my heart, when I went home that night, we lived on a farm in the foothills of North Carolina, and I looked out over the moonlit fields and into the woods beyond. And I got on my knees beside the bed, and I looked up at that moon for a long time, and I said, Oh, God, I don't know much about what I've done tonight, and I certainly don't know much about you, but what little I do know, please come into my heart tonight and change me and make me a new person. From that moment on, I started being different. I was headed in a new direction. I didn't have anybody to follow me up. I didn't have anybody to talk to me. And I didn't know how to communicate about what I had done. But I knew something was different. I was turned around. I was changed. And that's what conversion means. It means to change, to turn around. I'm going this way, and I turn, and I start this way. And then some people say, well, I don't want to go to church. They refuse Christ because of the church. And some people say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there are hypocrites in every area of life, I'll tell you. The church is not a society of saints. The church is 
for sinners saved by the grace of God. And the one requirement for membership in the true body of Christ is that you're unworthy to be a member. I'm not worthy to be a member of the body of Christ. I'm not worthy to be a member of the local church where I'm a member. Christ himself founded the church, and its purpose is to glorify God by worship. You see, we go to church to worship him. We go to church for the fellowship, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. The church is for strengthening our faith. You take one live coal and put it aside and it'll die, but put it with others and it'll live. The church is an influence for good in the community. The church is for the purpose of witness and service. But I think the main reason a lot of young people don't come to Christ is because they don't want to pay the price. And he will not compromise. He will not negotiate. You either come by repentance and faith or you don't come at all. And a lot of young people don't want to pay that kind of price. If you want an education, you'll pay most anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of other things to get money. But Jesus said even all those things, the scripture says, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Suppose you had all the wealth in the whole world and lost your soul. Would it be worth it? No. You see, your soul is that part of you that lives in your body and it's going to live forever. And the decision that many of you make right here tonight on the satellite places tonight will decide about your soul's eternal destiny. Now, many young people put it off. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You say, what do I have to do? You have to be willing to say, God, I'm a sinner. That's repentance. Turn from sin. Change your mind. That's repentance. Then faith is where you totally commit your life to Christ. You put him first from now on. Down in Cornwall, on Tuesday night, a 16-year-old girl gave her heart to Christ, we were told this week. And the next night, she found her counselor and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight, and we were reconciled. She was a runaway. An 18-year-old woman said that she had turned away from God at the age of 11 when her mother died. And as she responded to the invitation right here, on this pitch, she said, I know that I cannot go on any further in my life without Jesus. I'm sorry that I've been rejecting him for so long. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died saw the Mission Sheffield posters and thought, I don't know anything about God, but I think I'll go and hear what this man has to say. And he did, and he accepted Christ, and he made this statement. He said, I almost died without faith because in that accident, he came close to death. Tonight is the night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, as we've seen thousands this week here. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform here in the center and all around. And as you come, you're saying, I want Christ in my heart. I want him to take over my life. I'm turning my life over to him. I'm not sure. You may go to church. You may not go to church. You may be a good church member. You may not be. I don't know anything about you, but God knows, and you need him, and you may never have another moment like this as long as you live. This is your moment before God. You get up and come. telephone number you see on your screen is a number that you can call. 
for spiritual help and counseling. And as these many here at the stadium are making their decision for Christ, you make that call right now. People are standing by, ready to talk to you. can pick up your telephone and call that number on the screen. May God help you to make that commitment tonight with these many people that are coming here in Yorkshire, Sheffield, England. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin...